Well, hey, Trinity Online, we are so glad that you're joining us. Uh, maybe you've been tracking with us online for weeks or months. Uh, maybe this is your very first time, but either way, we are so, so glad. We're going to be wrapping up our series, The Jesus Way, today, uh, looking back at what we've been talking about and where we've come from and preparing our hearts and our minds uh, as we head into Holy Week and uh, preparing to celebrate Good Friday and Easter next weekend. So it's going to be a great service. We're so glad you're with us, whether you're watching right here in Kelowna, somewhere across the country, or even the globe. Uh, but as we get ready to dive in, we're going to check out three things that you need to know around here. Check it out. Happy Sunday, church family. My name is Elise, and I am here to tell you all about the top three things going on here at Trinity in the coming weeks. Let's discover the ways that we can be better together. At number one, we have got some fresh courses starting up again on April 18th. As a church, we measure in life change, and we want to equip and empower you for a life with Jesus. Our courses are for everyone, for new, growing, and mature followers of Jesus who want to take their next step in faith. You can jump into Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, an eight-week course that teaches us how to slow down our lives to develop our own personal relationship with Jesus. We'll discover topics like knowing and becoming your authentic self in Christ, discovering how our families of origins affect us emotionally, and designing a lifelong path to live in God's love the emotionally healthy way. You could also jump into Rule of Life, a four-week course that teaches us what it looks like to have an intentional, conscious plan to keep God at the center of everything we do. Together, we'll explore what it means to love God with our soul, our emotions, intellect, and body, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. To register and to find all of the details for our upcoming courses, visit the courses page on our website today. At number two, we are looking forward to celebrating Good Friday and Easter in just a few weeks. We know that life transformation and the encounters with God that we have today are only because of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. We can't forget to slow down, reflect, acknowledge the moments that Jesus had as he endured the cross on our behalf. So on April 7th, you are invited to join us for our Good Friday service in person and online at 10 a.m. as we reflect on the death and life of Jesus. And because we know that the story doesn't end there, we get to celebrate new life together and Jesus' triumphant victory on Easter Sunday, April 9th, in person and online, also at 10 a.m. Take note that Trinity Kids will be in full swing for Easter Sunday, but there will be no Trinity Kids or nursery available on Good Friday. Parents with little ones who need a space away are so welcome to use our parent room located at the back of our auditorium. Pick up an invitation in the lobby after our service or head over to our website to download an invite that you can send to a friend or family member or post on social media. Be courageous, invite the whole crew, and don't miss this opportunity to share the love of Jesus and celebrate his spirit at work in us today. And at number three, we could not be more excited to tell you about what our Trinity kids have in store for summer stuff this July. Whether you call Kelowna home all year round or just for the summer months, we know that the summer in the Okanagan is the perfect place for doing awesome stuff. Your kids aged three to grade five are invited to join us for an epic week at our summer stuff camp from July 24th to 28th. There, they'll get to jump into a week packed full of exciting activities, time with amazing leaders, opportunities to discover who Jesus is, fun offsite trips, and all around a fun summer experience that they will definitely be bragging about when they come home. Early bird registration is open right now until May 1st with late registration closing on July 1st. For all of the information of what you and your child can expect when they join us at Summer Stuff, visit the kids page on our website today. To find out more about these three things this week or any week, visit the events page on our website at trinitychurchcolona.ca. Check us out on Facebook or Instagram or have a conversation with somebody over at the link after today's service. Right now, we are diving into the last week of our teaching series titled The Jesus Way, and we already know that Jesus has something to say to you through it. Let's dive in together. Well, 
Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be together. Uh, you know, we believe that our God is at work. Wherever you're coming from here today, whatever circumstances you're in the midst of, God's at work. And we've seen him moving already here today. And we believe, you know, we're, we're heading towards Easter, but we don't have to wait till Easter to celebrate this resurrection power, right? Our God is at work. He's at work here today. And I believe that he's got something in store for every single one of us, wherever we are watching from, wherever we are sitting in the room. God's at work. Let's stand. Let's celebrate together. Come on. Amen. And 
hands, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Crave on you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
faith. Come on, we sing it. You're perfect in all of your ways. Yes. You're perfect in all of your ways. You're perfect in all of your ways to us. Come on, church, one more time. We declare he's perfect in all his ways. You're perfect in all of your ways. Oh, you're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, great are you, Lord. High above. High above all things, great are you, Lord, even today as you are, great are you, Lord, above all things. As we sing those words, great are you, Lord, we recognize that it's Palm Sunday. And just like we're gathered and we're singing out those praises, great are you, Lord, on Palm Sunday, the crowds gathered as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. It says in the Gospel of Matthew that the disciples brought the donkey and the colt and they placed their cloaks on them and Jesus sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Who is this? Some, some thought that Jesus was the Messiah sent by God to rescue them, the long awaited Messiah. But others, they weren't sure that Jesus was who he said he was. Some thought Jesus was a liar. Some thought, no, he's, he's crazy. <laughs> he has to be. Others were threatened by Jesus. But I love that picture that the whole city was stirred and asked, who is Jesus? Because it's the exact same question that you and I need to wrestle with today. Who is Jesus? The Jesus that we find in the scriptures, the Jesus that we're invited to know and to follow and to trust the one that said, I have come so that you might have life and have it to the full. And it says, the crowds answered, this, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we enter into Holy Week, as we pause and reflect on Palm Sunday, as Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, prepared to give his life. God, we wrestle with that question. Who is Jesus in, in my life? Is he Lord? Is he Savior? Father, I pray that as we spend this time together this morning, that we would get to know Jesus better that we would have an even clearer picture of who he is and of your love for us in him and through him. Would we experience it? Would we rest in it? Would we be in awe? And would we be reminded, God, that you love us more than we could possibly imagine? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
but you can go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, And as you do, we're going to continue in our worship through giving, uh, taking what God has given to us and giving some of that back to him as an act of worship. And so there's several different ways to give that are going to come up on the screens. Uh, But we just need to say thank you for the ways that you do give so faithfully and consistently, or those of you that maybe have just joined our community and are considering what it might look like uh, to start giving. When we talked earlier about things that are happening in our faith community, things like summer stuff, uh, registration just opened yesterday and we've got hundreds of kids already registered, uh, families who are registered who aren't connected to our faith community, who are just part of our city, kids who are coming who don't know Jesus, and this is going to be an opportunity for them to be loved on by leaders and to to hear about a God who is wild about them and created them and loves them. And so know that when you give in moments like this, uh, it allows us to reach people who are far from Jesus and it makes an eternal difference. We're so, so grateful. Uh, Speaking about worship, typically the very first Wednesday of the month, we would have our worship nights on Wednesday nights, which would be this Wednesday, Um, but want to make sure that you know that because uh, we've got Good Friday services on Friday and then, of course, Easter, uh, we're pausing this month to create space to be able to gather on Friday for Good Friday and then again on Easter, and so those will pick up again in May. So just wanted to make sure that that is on your radar. Uh, And in just a minute, Scott's going to be up wrapping up our series, The Jesus Way, looking at what it really means when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what does that look like? And we've been kind of working through this series over the course of this year. We started in uh, January and February and then took a pause uh, as we worked through our relationship goals series and then have picked it up again these last several weeks. And so before Scott comes to wrap it up, we thought we would just take a look back uh, at some of the things that we feel that God was saying to us, the things that we were learning and being challenged in as we discovered together what it looks like to follow after the Jesus way. Check this out. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where we're going, so how can we know the way? And then Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This this series is all about learning how to follow Jesus in our cultural moment in 2023. We'll look specifically at how Jesus' love made him stand out and eventually how that love completely turned the world upside down. We'll we'll discover what it means that Jesus is the way, how he is the truth, and how he gives us the life we've always wanted. God makes broken things beautiful. It's what he does, and it's who he is. And he'll meet you right where you are. He'll meet you in the middle of all of your questions. I am the way and the truth and the life. He brings wholeness into a broken world, doesn't he? He redeems what is shattered and he shines light in the darkness. He shines light into the darkness, into the tension in your marriage, into the strained relationship with your kids, into your battle with depression, into the insecurities that you wrestle with when you look into the mirror or right into the middle of your struggle at school. Jesus says, hey, in the midst of what you're facing, I'm still the way. I'm still where you'll find peace. I'm where you'll find hope. And even when you're in the midst of it, even though you might not always see it, I'm still at work. For Jesus and his original hearers and for us, the parable creates a story that leads you into mystery And it creates a space for you to respond, to be discerning, to become wise. One writer puts it this way, discernment is the time between hearing the word and living the word. Journeying through understanding and journeying through discovery as a community and then living it out. That's what we are called to do to live out the kingdom of God in our midst. We're supposed to partner with Jesus, to engage in the mysteries of God, to explore these truths, to engage the story in a new way. We we don't want to get locked into our box of belief, do we? 
We don't want to get so locked into our experience with God that whatever has happened up in this moment is all there's going to be. No, we, we want our faith, our, our, our life with Jesus to move, right? To, to grow, to expand, to transform, because it's not only about who you are, it's also about who you're becoming. Deconstruction without reconstruction is a tragedy, If the path you're on isn't making you a more generous, compassionate, hopeful, and merciful person, or in other words, more like Jesus, then the destination isn't worth the journey. Make no mistake, there are things within Christian culture that need to be challenged and reevaluated, but a Christ-honoring deconstruction revels in truth and beauty and not cynicism and arrogance. Deconstruction, it's marked by humility and honesty and courage, and it leads to reconstruction. Well, hopefully you uh, were able to take in at least some elements of our series. If not, you're able to always go back on YouTube and check it out. But we wanted to bring you back to where we've been so you can be reminded again of where we are and more so of where we're going. And today, as Sarah mentioned, it is the wrap-up of our series on the Jesus way, and we find ourselves back in the upper room. And no matter how you found yourself here, whether this is your first time, your first time after a long time, or you've been here forever, or you're joining us online, we are incredibly grateful that you chose to spend a little time for us, with us. And, and, and the invitation is this, that you don't just come here and, and kind of do the church thing or join us online, rather that you enter in. That's the whole point of what Jesus invites us to. He doesn't invite us to just be a bystander. He invites us to be an active participant, to to participate with him, to to journey with him, to walk alongside of him. And that's why we've been investing in the Jesus way to remind ourselves, to remind myself of who Jesus was, what he did, how he interacted with people, how he engaged with others around him. And so it doesn't just kind of allow us to have a good story. Rather, it informs our experience and our relationship with Jesus today. Not just to sing about it or post about it or talk about it. It's how you and I live it. At the beginning of our Jesus Way series, we listen in on a conversation between Jesus and the disciples in the upper room. Just as their lives seemed to be coming apart at the seams, if you recall, there was confusion and anxiety and doubt. And today, at the end of our series, we find ourselves right back there. As Sarah mentioned on our calendar, today is the beginning of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. For us, it's a solemn week following the footsteps of Jesus, Holy Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday through to Easter Sunday. And for many of you, you've been observing it from Lent 40 days ago. And maybe for you, it's just starting this week. Being mindful, reflecting. You see, the first Holy Week was nothing like the disciples expected. For them, it was completely different. It was the Passover festival, commemorating the last of the 10 plagues of Egypt when the angel passed over the door frames and the eventual exodus of the Hebrew slaves from Egypt under the leadership of Moses. They were celebrating that. And the exodus story is not only the most important event in the formation of the people of Israel in the first century, it also represented a message of freedom, a message of redemption. And for first century Jews, the ultimate ideal of overflow, overthrowing the Roman influence and rule in their lives that's been there every single day of their existence. And for the disciples, they've been there sensing at this Passover festival that things were about to change. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the one who will finally lead the Jewish people to overcome the Romans, to conquer them. And they had walked with Jesus as he entered Jerusalem on a donkey as Sarah read his people, waving palm branches, shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And yet now, just a few days later, the disciples are sitting with Jesus, the rabbi, eating, drinking, and as he's sharing with them in the upper room, but, but he's talking about a different way, a terrifying way full of agony, 
torture, and death. They couldn't imagine it. This was not what they had been taught. You can't forget. Like for Jewish people, life, well, everything centered on the Torah or the law. The first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It formed the heart of how they understood themselves in God. It told every single Jewish person how to live. You see, the Torah was the center of the educational system of Jesus' day, all taught, all taught by the most highly regarded individuals in the communities, rabbis or teachers. And they were the ones with the PhDs. Rabbis were passionate and funny, spontaneous, gregarious, and oh so wise. And every single parent wanted their kid to be a rabbi. And so Jewish kids would go to school called Bet Sefer at the synagogue and learn from the Torah at age six. And from age to six to 10, the Torah, the five books, of the uh, book, first books of the Bible would be their lesson plan. And for four years, they would study so that by age 10, they would have memorized all five books word for word. Okay, I know, I've lost some of you because some of you have kids and you're thinking, my grade 12 kid can't even spell Okanagan, right? Like you're, <laughs> you're like, how in the world? I won't say anything about my own son here. I think I just did say something about my own son not being able to spell. <laughs> I'm not sure hooked on phonics worked. I'm just, I'm, oh, Brady's gonna get, kill me after that one. But what, what the Jewish first century people understood they knew if their faith was to survive, it had to be part of who they were, right? That if the Torah was not deep in the bones of the next generation, it would become extinct. Families did not own a copy of the Torah. They didn't own a copy of the Bible like you and I have 10 or 12 of them or carry it with us. The only copy would have been found at the local synagogue with the rabbi. And at the age of 10, the selection would begin. The best of the best. The A-plus students would be given the opportunity to advance their education while the rest, well, the rest would realize they weren't good enough, smart enough, so they'd stay at home and learn the family trade like being a pastor and my son. <laughs> For many of them, that was fishing. If you were one of the lucky ones, if you actually had learned so much and came to the top of the class, at 10 years old, you got to enter the next stage, Bet Talmud, House of Learning which lasted roughly to age 14. There they would memorize the rest of the Hebrew scriptures, like the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and they, they'd begin to learn interpretations of it and how to ask good questions and, and get good answers. There they would have to demonstrate their love, their knowledge, and their respect for the scriptures. And then they knew what was coming, the next selection. After eight years of study, the very cream of the crop would go to what is the equivalent of Harvard, Yale, or MIT on a full-ride scholarship. It was called Bet Midrash, or House of Study. Except, very few students ever made it this far. Students, if, if, if they thought they could make it, would seek out their favorite rabbi. Each one of the rabbis had certain ways of interpreting the scriptures, not unlike some of our churches or denominations, what it meant to live out the Torah, because it couldn't just be in your head, it had to be lived out in your life. It was intense, difficult, all-consuming for these students. The disciples' job was to become like the rabbi in every single way, so much so that some Hebrew scholars say that if a rabbi was hurt and had a limp, you might see his healthy disciples walking behind him in his footsteps with a limp. A rabbi's particular way was called their yoke. This is how they do it. It's interesting when Jesus, a rabbi, talked about his, his yoke, do you recall? He said, take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. At that point in their lives, the students faced their greatest challenge. They would need to convince a rabbi they were worthy of being a disciple. They would have to earn the right to be heard. Rabbis would be relentless with their interrogation of pers prospective students. Do you have what it takes? Do you understand what you're talking about? And if they passed, and only very few passed, he would say what a student had been longing to hear for 15 years, come follow me. 
So I can only imagine. As the 12 disciples are listening to Jesus talk about betrayals and, and denials and departures, the last three and a half years are just rushing through their minds when they first met Jesus. Just every moment they spent with him, the, the parable of the lost ones or, or that experience with Jairus and the bleeding woman or that experience with Nicodemus and, the, and it's just going through their heads over and over and over and I'm sure it went back to the beginning like Simon and Andrew out on the Sea of Galilee fishing and they see this rabbi, Jesus, walking along the beach, not in a synagogue, not taking interviews, looking at them who obviously never made it past the first cut in rabbi school. And, and Mark puts it this way. He says, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting an net into the lake for they were fishermen. As uh, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. All their lives, Simon and Andrew felt like a B player. They weren't smart enough, rich enough, good enough. They were not the A team. Their chance to ever be anything disappeared at age 10. They had no chance of convincing any rabbi on the planet to take them on. So when this rabbi walks down the beach and says, hey, you guys, why don't you come follow me? Of course they dropped their nets. And they said, I'm absolutely following but you know, as I read that story, I wonder, I wonder if you might find yourself there. Maybe you feel like one of those disciples in the upper room with Jesus. Like, I wonder, have, have you ever felt like a B player? You know what I'm talking about? Like in, in, bas in high school, I played basketball and I was a decent basketball player. I wasn't like fantastic, but I could shoot the fee, if you will. And uh, I, I was really good at NCAA basketball pools during March Madness. Uh, I only say that because I just won ours at Trinity here. So I was feeling really good about that. Uh, I, I was good at that, but I wasn't the best basketball player. And so I made the logical decision when I went to the collegiate level and played uh, in uh, in at uh, Briarcrest, that I would switch sports and move to volleyball. It made so much sense because, you know, my height and everything, why did that I have no hot clue? Anyways, I tried out for the team in volleyball and I put my best effort. I was hardworking. It, I, I should have been a libero before there was a libero and, and there just wasn't a libero at the time, but I could set and I could uh, play defense. But I'll never forget, they were going to post who made the team on the wall. And the coach brought me aside and he sat down. And I thought he sat down with everybody and I found out later, no, he just sat down with me. And he said, Scott, I want you to know, I didn't put you on the team because of your skill set. I put you on the team because you're funny. <laughs> Man, wow. Yeah, PTSD from that one, let me tell you right now. <laughs> it got so deep, you know what I'm saying? Oh my goodness. Story of my life. Um, I'll never forget that moment. And I'm like, well, I made the team, so here I go, right? And I worked hard. I showed up early for practice, I stayed late. I worked on my serve, I worked on my defense, I did everything possible. I tried to win many competitions when we had practices, and I'll never forget, it was before the playoffs and we had a, a warm-up tournament that had no bearing on anything whatsoever. It didn't matter in our standards and we drove to Winnipeg and uh, we, I know that's depressing itself as well. And uh, we went to Winnipeg and we played this tournament and we'd won the first match and we were playing a second match. And this was a team we were playing called the Menos, believe it or not. And they, uh, our coach had played for that team back in the day and so he really wanted to beat them. And during the match, our starting center uh, setter went down and he... Uh, fractured his finger. And I'll never forget, I, I was sitting on the bench and that anticipation grew in me because I'd been working for this moment. I was so excited for the moment. And I remember catching the coach's eyes and I was like ready and there was a bit of angst and excitement. And then his eyes passed over me and he called another guy down the bench and he took him into the game. You know, I felt pretty worthless at that time. I know, it's just a game. But actually, maybe worth is too strong. You just feel less, you know what I mean? Like there isn't a need for you. Maybe it's why you're here today. You're just not sure why you're here today. Maybe your marriage blew up or you didn't make it into university. You got cut from that team. Your job just fractured. Your finances are upside down. You just don't even know where the mortgage payment's going to come from. 
Maybe your life is just taking a course you didn't know and you're discouraged or disappointed. Maybe, maybe the Christian community said somehow you were disqualified from following Jesus and so you just never bothered. See, the confidence and faith Jesus had in his first disciples wasn't because they were anything special. He just chose them. Don't miss this. With Jesus, there's nothing you can do to be chosen. See, the Jesus way is announced to all people. It is independent of your education, economics, race, sexuality, or anything else we might judge others by. You are invited, Jesus says. Which means, if you're not a religious person, or you have doubts or questions, there is no sin or no habit, no addiction, no problem or illness that puts you on the outside of the circle of Jesus meeting you at the beach. Even if you don't know if you believe him yet. Andrew and Simon, they weren't believers yet. They couldn't have known what to believe yet. They hadn't followed that rabbi. Yet Jesus says, come, follow me. And I know for a fact that Jesus would look at you and say, come follow me too. If you aren't convinced of it, convinced of it in that same upper room, Jesus said this to the disciples, you did not chose me, I chose you. See, following the Jesus mean, way means you identify with Jesus and I begin to identify with you, he says. The rabbi, Jesus says, you can be like me. I choose you, follow me. Which is what makes the Jesus way so genius. God's grace meets us where we're at, accepts us as we are, but God's grace does not leave us there. It always is a transforming acceptance, so that in God's very act of loving, we are being changed. Romans 1.15 says, For I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. And those disciples... And you and me, although we're so sinful people and we get it wrong, we also bear the image of Jesus and we step out in all our failures and all our questions and all our doubts and say, I believe, I believe your power and I believe what you can do. And there they are, a bunch of uneducated, underwhelming, rejected and hated guys listening, wanting to experience that from a rabbi. You have to remember that they were just this eclectic group of people. Fishermen, like we talked about Peter, known as Simon and Andrew, who were brothers. And another set of brothers were sitting in that room with Jesus too, James and John, who were also brothers. A chief tax collector, Matthew, who made sure his pockets were filled first. A political activist, Simon. A thief, Judas Iscariot. And then there was Philip and Nathaniel, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, and Judas, son of James, who we don't know much about because there probably wasn't much to know. And there they are. And Jesus had looked each one of them in the eye and said, I choose you. Follow me. And here they all sit in this room, longing for things to be different. Minutes away from Jesus leading them to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to be betrayed by one of their very own Hand it over to the Roman soldiers. And Jesus is talking as their world is spinning. And this word just keeps coming up as he's talking. And, and they can't seem to shake it. It just seems like this word just comes up and up and up again. You can see it in John 14, 1. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. As a matter of fact, in the first 14 verses of this chapter 14, believe appears six times as Jesus is talking to his followers. Believe me, believe in me, whoever believes in me. And when he says it, don't get it wrong. It's not an encouragement. It's not a sentimental statement. It's not like a warm fuzzy. No, each and every time it's a command, believe. He was looking at the disciples and he knew their stories. He knew their failures. He knew their doubts and he knew the hours ahead were holding some of the greatest regrets the 12 would ever know. And he looked at them. And he looked at me. And he looked at you. And he says, believe. And I couldn't think of a greater time to put up a Ted Lasso sign of believe. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody there? Anybody there? <laughs> I'm not endorsing Ted necessarily, but I'm just saying believe. You know what I'm saying? 
For those who don't know what Ted Lasso, this is a sign in the locker room for Ted Lasso. Believe. Don't miss that. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus knew that if belief is what protects your heart from trouble, then unbelief is what produces trouble in your heart. Don't miss that. If belief is what protects your heart from trouble, then unbelief is what produces trouble in your heart. It's the opposite. If you believe, you get protected from that trouble. But if you don't believe, it produces this trouble in your heart, this anxiety, and you get caught up in unbelief. Have you ever been there? You know, as I was studying for this, some commentators brought up this beautiful parallel in Exodus chapter 14. It's from Moses and the people of Israel. Maybe you recall the story that they have been under hundreds of years of slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. And God calls Moses to set his people free. And so they go into this experience with plagues because the Pharaoh doesn't want to let them go. And after the 10th plague, finally, he allows them to go. And then as uh, Moses and the people head out to the promised land, Pharaoh has second thoughts, if you recall. And he gathers an arm and he says, actually, no, I want to keep them here. And so he pursues them. And the story goes in Exodus 14, as as the Israelite people are catching up to the Red Sea, the army's catching up to them. And this is what happens in Exodus 14. Look, they said to Moses, the people of Israel, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Hey, Moses, I'm feeling some trouble right now because there's a Red Sea here and there's an army back here. So what are you doing? Did you just bring us here so we're going to die before everybody right in this spot? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. These people are being sarcastic and rude, complaining, they're opinionated, they're scapegoating Moses, they're saying, it's your fault, we wanted to stay, they didn't want to stay, there's no way they wanted to stay, but they're making up stuff because trouble causes trouble, and that's what happens when we don't believe, anxiety, frustration, finger pointing, panic, unbelief produces trouble, you've been there, I've been there, And you got to look how Moses replies. He doesn't try and negotiate. He he doesn't choose one side or the other. He doesn't even try and stand up for himself. He speaks faith and belief into them. Now, you have to believe when you read this next text, it's not quiet. It's not just trying to be like a soft cell or like a prayer room door. No, this is a pump up speech he's given. It kind of like Daryl Sutter's trying to do between periods of another hockey game the Calgary Flames are losing. Do you know what I'm talking about? That, that kind of where he gets in there and he's trying so hard to get them to play well. This is what Moses says in Exodus 14. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you need only to be still. Moses said, don't be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you need only be still. Moses didn't have the solution yet. He was speaking truth and belief into the people. He was saying, I trust God. I have the belief. And when I have the belief, that trouble disappears. So let that trouble disappear. Because you know what? God's going to fight for you. You only need to be still. Moses was like, this is not who we are. God fights for us. We're not victims. The God who created the world is on your side. You're not an underdog. The God who spoke the world into existence gives us faith. We do not need to be defeated and discouraged. We know the plan, Moses says. Step into it. And you know what? We know the game plan too, don't we? We know the one we follow, Jesus, that he's the way, the embodiment of truth, and the source of life. We up here speak hope and faith into people. That's what we do at Trinity. We speak hope and faith and say, hey, don't let that unbelief capture you. Believe God and let it produce faith. We sang about it earlier. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You've done great things, and I know you will do it again for what? Your promise is yes and amen. Amen. (laughs) 
Moses says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I don't know, maybe that's a word for you today. I know it's a word for me. Like, all cards on the table, I, 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 I have to be still because I have to believe that God's going to fight for me. You know, I'm in this role called acting lead pastor, which means I'm acting like a lead pastor. I'm not quite a lead pastor. Um, <laughs> and uh, my family's had fun with it. My, my kids call themselves kelps, kids of the acting lead pastor. And, and my wife's a whelp, the wife of the acting lead pastor. Uh, we have so much fun with it. But you know what? God's going to fight for me. God's going to fight for you. You need only to be still. You need to only be still, Moses says. And whatever situation you're in, it's not about the title, is it? It's not about what you do. It's not about how good you are. It's that God will fight for you, right? And you just need to what? Be still. Let him fight for you. Let him take it for you. You get out of the way because it's not about you anyways, is it? And look what the Lord says to Moses in Exodus 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I think that's so funny. Moses says, be still. And God says, giddy up. <laughs> right? Like, I love how one author puts it. He says, this is what belief does for us, being still without being stopped. Oh, isn't that good? Being still without being stopped. We can have stillness in our soul and in our spirit, but move forward with our feet. Right? We can have this stillness with God, but we keep on moving. We keep courageously stepping into it. We keep going, knowing the stillness of God, knowing God's going to fight for me, even if the Red Sea is in front of me and an army's behind me. I don't, I don't stall. I don't stop. I don't look back and complain. I'm not anchored to the past. I'm tethered to the future. You know what I'm talking about? I look forward and I say, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to be still. And my spirit is going to be still. And what does God do? He splits the sea and they walk through it. You keep moving forward. We spring ahead about 1,500 years. And I'm sure that story was on a loop in the disciples' minds. They had memorized it. They knew that story. It was the very reason they were eating that meal with Jesus in the upper room during Passover. That was the point. And only like Jesus does, never anxious, never uncertain, never confused, never overwhelmed, never panicked. Jesus is the manufacturer of peace and the distributor. He says, don't worry. I'm 100% confident of what is going on. It's not over. It's just the beginning. John 14 says, Jesus talking, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I, I will come to you. Jesus says there's another advocate. There's one just like me, exactly the same as me that will be with you. In the Greek, the word is paraclete, which is the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it's this abundant word. It means comforter, encourager, helper, strengthener, intercessor, counselor. Jesus said there's one exactly like me, right? You've watched me. You, 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 you've watched me encourage people, help people, comfort people. You've watched me intercede on behalf of people, heal people. You've wa help, watched me do all these things. There's exactly the same as me will be with you. It's called the Holy Spirit. And not only is with you, he's in you and for you. And by the way, Jesus says, it's not a power, it's a person. 
Jesus was saying to them, I know I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. This made all the difference for the disciples. You can read it for yourself. But when the Holy Spirit showed up, whew, this ragtag group of nobodies pulled off something no one ever expected. They did greater things than their rabbi did, just like he said. Their souls were still, but their feet were moving. Peter leads the first church, opening the way for anyone to believe Jews and Gentiles. Andrew became a powerful preacher. Matthew took the gospel to Ethiopia and Egypt. Thomas crossed the Arabian Sea, taking the message of Jesus to India. Simon went to the west coast of Africa and England. And almost every single one of them were killed for what they believed. Five of them, Peter, Andrew, Simon, James, and Nathaniel, died hanging on a cross just like their rabbi. But just as Jesus promised, they were never alone. So what does this mean for you and I today? We've heard it throughout this series. Believe. Believe. Step into that belief. Don't let trouble or doubt get in the way and produce fear. Now step into it. Rest in it. Be still in it and move forward with it. Peter, later on in his gospel, 2 Peter, he says, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Jesus invites every single one of us and says, I want you to follow me. I want you to acknowledge me with your life and acknowledge that there's this thing, sin, that gets in the way, and I want you to confess that sin to me. And when you do that, I'm going to give you a life so beyond what you could possibly believe that no matter what circumstance you, you find yourself in, where, where the way forward seems difficult and there's somebody pursuing you on the way back, that you can stand there and go, God, I believe you. You'll fight for me. And Jesus says, I will do exactly that. So for some of you today, maybe it's just you got to believe. For others, it's about time that you kept moving forward. As Jesus said, you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. See, the same one, the Holy Spirit, comes alongside of you and me today. The Holy Spirit, as a matter of fact, is at work right now. You are not alone in your apartment at night, in your marriage, in the hospital room that turns into a hospice room. If you follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives with you and in you, the comforter, the encourager, the helper, the strengthener, the interceder. He comes and he lives with us and he's in here today prodding and encouraging and calming and bringing his peace. And the Holy Spirit is for you and is for me. And Jesus says, he's exactly like me. Step into him, rest in him, allow him to move you forward. It's profound to me that we find ourselves at Palm Sunday in the upper room at that very time and place that Jesus had the Last Supper with the disciples. And in that upper room, they had that bread and that wine at the table. And Jesus knew it was coming, way more than they knew it was coming. And he knew what they were going to encounter far more than what they were going to encounter. And he knew that they couldn't do it alone, that they needed his spirit, one just like him, to walk every step of the way. And as Jesus invited them to partake in the elements that day, he invites you to do the same. To step, to listen, to believe. The band's going to play a song here. And it's one for you just to listen and look at the lyrics. It's a, it's a song meant to encourage you of why that moment in the upper room was so poignant. Why, when Jesus shared communion with his disciples, it meant so much? Why, when he said what the symbols represent, transformed everything? And it's why we do it today. So before we take the elements, would you take a moment 
And as the band sings, look at the lyrics. Maybe put yourself in that room with you and the disciples and Jesus. Maybe think of what you're experiencing right now and choose to believe. Save 
night he was betrayed. After all the conversations, after all the drama of Judas leaving and Peter knowing he was going to be denying Jesus, after all the three and a half years of stories and experiences of ups and downs, of failures and successes, in all the wonders and questions, Jesus looked at those same 12 guys sitting beside him. And the love was just pouring out of his eyes. And he looks at you and me today. And he says, this, this is my body. And it's going to be broken for you. And I do it willingly. And I do it faithfully. And I do it for you. So take, eat and remember me. In the same way the Bible tells us that Jesus took a glass or a bottle that was there of wine and he said, this symbol is going to transform your life. This is a symbol of a brand new way of doing things. You know the Torah? It's different now. It's the Jesus way. And so my blood is a symbol of it spilled out for you. A brand new way of doing things. So take Drink and remember me. Would you stand with me? The band's got, a, got another song as we kind of give an opportunity to respond today. And as we do every week, we say, hey, we believe the Spirit is here and the Spirit wants to speak with you. And even more so on this Sunday, Palm Sunday, we believe God wants to speak to you in this very moment. And that's why we have people in community that are standing faithfully for you and with you at our response stations. that are to pray with you, listen to you, put an arm around you, be still with you. But knowing that we need to do this together. In community, that's why we do this. To remind you that you're not alone. And so if you need to take some time as the band sings, to just sing, sing. If you need to take some time to be quiet and pray, pray. If you need someone to come alongside of you, respond. <laughs> Go to one of the stations, allow one of our prayer team to just love on you and encourage you. And believe, and believe so much that it keeps you Moving forward. I love how Paul puts it in Romans 15. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's lift our voices up together to Jesus, who is the risen one, the King of Kings, our stronghold. Will you join us as we continue to sing? Strongholds bowing to the Savior, resurrection power over every circumstance. And his word stands final and forever.
blessed, God, we thank you. I am blessed, I am called, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved in Jesus' name. Highly favored, anointed, filled with your power for the glory of Jesus' name. Come on, we keep singing that. I am blessed, I am called. experienced it. As we head into this week, Lord, would you continue to do your work in us, preparing us for uh, the, the remembrance and the celebration that's ahead of us. God, you've already paid it all. You've already sent your spirit. God, help us to live in the truth of knowing that and knowing that it's your strength within to face these days as crazy as they are. 
God, we love you. We praise you for moments like this. And we know that it's not just about this gathering, but your work is going to continue as we walk through these doors into our workplaces, our homes, our families, whatever it may be. Continue to lead us, we pray, in the powerful, life-changing name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us today, everyone. We'll see you on Friday for Good Friday service. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, our online community. Um, we just finished singing, God, you're so good. And maybe you sing that easily today. Uh, or maybe uh, there's that line in the song we sing before that says resurrection power in every circumstance. And maybe that's uh, just an encouragement to you to hold on to this week as we practice uh, being still and moving forward as we head into Holy Week. Uh, we will be live streaming our Good Friday service. That's this Friday at 10 a.m. and then of course be gathering again in person and online on Easter Sunday at 10 a.m. And so we're praying for you this week and we'll see you back here at 10 a.m. on Friday.